Welcome back to Historical Context. Today we continue with our series on Virginia during the Restoration. Today's episode starts in June of 1680 with the arrival of Governor Culpepper, also known as Lord Culpepper, to the colony after a long absence of leadership. Uh, he spent a lot of time in England at the start of his, uh, his term as governor. Culpepper arrived and spoke to the General Assembly requesting acts on a free and general pardon, an act of naturalization to boost population, and to continue the two shilling per hogshead of tobacco duty to the crown. On June 16th, the acts of general pardon and the Naturalization Act were passed by the House of Burgesses. The Hogshed Act, the tax on tobacco, was passed the next day, and it was called the Act of Raising Revenue to Better Support the Government. Several petitions came into the House of Burgesses during this time requesting financial relief for damages committed during the rebellion. Many of these claims were denied with no rationale provided. On June 23rd, the House voted to continue the service of 25 men as soldiers at each fort and that the charge for these men be funded by the general public. That's the Virginia colonists. A couple of days later, the question was raised as to whether or not the fort should be continued. The vote was 18 to 15 against. A few days later, a vote was taken to reassume the act for raising public revenue for the better support of the government, and it passed 23 to 16. So a vote to reassume means that the law is now back up for discussion, and Governor Culpepper responds to the Burgesses. Let's have a look. Totally surprised with this, which is totally unparliamentary and will make the exercise of assemblies wholly impracticable, if not impossible, except the House of Burgesses pretend to be the sole legislative power which no House of Commons in England ever did till first voted away, both king and lords. So I want to focus on the end there. Governor's not happy. And he's only been there a few weeks, and there's already tension and disagreement with the local legislative body. But he, he says at the end of this quote, uh, the House of Burgess is pretending to be the sole legislative power, which no House of Commons in England ever did till first voted away, both king and lords. What he means by that is the English Civil War. He's saying they're acting like the Parliament did during the English Civil War which that's a, a pretty big slap across the face. He goes on in his response, this is Culpepper, to point out that it is the right of the king to collect these taxes. And the king has been generous in his delays to collect quit rents from the colonists. The Burgesses went on to pass the act, the Hogshed Tobacco Act, or the act for the better support of government through revenue, whatever you want to call it. Uh, but they, in doing so, kind of create a caveat. They voided all other acts that mentioned to tobacco tax prior to this one. So if this is the tax that you want, this is the only tax you're going to get. And we've somewhat touched on this in the podcast before that hogshed taxes on tobaccos been around for a while. But this assembly mentions that there were actually three taxes, three different taxes passed in the 1660s. So they got rid of all of them except for the one that was being requested. I wonder how that's going to go over. On June 25th, the Burgesses vote to reduce the number of soldiers down to 20 versus 25. And this is probably in response to the tobacco tax. you got to find the money now. They also draft a letter to the king accepting the tobacco tax as long as it voids all previous mentions and previous taxes. The assembly also reviewed the laws regarding indentured servants, 
where they found the current certification process to be adequate. It appears as if some indentured servants had been petitioning for their freedom in the lower courts due to the belief that their terms had expired. And this may kind of make sense. If you're an indentured servant in Virginia, you may not exactly know how much time has passed. And so the, some of these folks are now petitioning for freedom in the court system. On July 8th, Lord Culpepper repeals six acts of Virginia relating to the rebellion as he viewed them no longer relevant. One dealt with the recovery of losses from the rebellion. So this goes back to the courts not listening to people. It looks as if the day to claim you had lost money from the rebellion or lost assets is over. William Fitzhugh, who is a planter and trader, wrote extensively starting about this time and lasting for the rest of the century. And he wrote that summer that the natives were being rather quiet, so attacks on the frontier had stopped. He also writes a letter later that summer offering to pay three pounds per year for five years for a good servant. So instead of an indentured servant, he's willing to pay a salary to an actual servant. I see this as an evolution of the indentured servant model. I think the indentured servant model is beginning to go away here. And this is probably a point where we're going to start to see more slavery in Virginia and the colonial South. Several other letters in the summer of 1680 refer to the natives as peaceful. In October, the Committee of Foreign Plantations back in England responds to the tobacco tax amendment. And while they agree with the repealing of old acts, there's a provision in this bill excusing ship owners from the tax. And it was found to be unfavorable by the committee. And a draft order was made for the repealing of that exemption. The Privy Council writes to Governor Culpepper stating that ship owner's exemption is in violation of the king's wishes and provides unfavorable treatment. The council requests the journals of all council and legislative sessions for the colony. They want to read everything now. They're getting to a point where they're not trusting Virginia to handle its own affairs. In November, King Charles II issues an order that no colonial governor is to return to England without express permission from the crown. Virginia had also requested a cessation of planting tobacco for the year 1681, and the crown denied it on the basis that they were afraid other European colonies would increase their market share. Everything seems to be quiet and quiets down until mid-1681, when letters begin to hint that the Seneca natives are attacking livestock and robbing some colonists. At the same time, the king wrote to Governor Culpepper and requested a better monitoring and accounting of all quit rents. Also, the minutes in a July 1681 Committee of Trade and Plantations reveal that the committee no longer agrees with the original commission of Governor Culpepper. A reasoning and revisions aren't mentioned, though, so we don't know why. That same month, the House of Burgesses petitions the king once again for a cessation of tobacco planning and for some tax relief. In October, Governor Culpepper sends a proposal regarding the development of the Virginia colony. In it, he calls for the building of towns, the constant payment and quartering, that's housing, of soldiers, and the free trade with certain native tribes. Culpepper also continues to keep a standing army due to the threat of the Seneca natives. The king ordered the companies of men disbanded by Christmas unless... The colony wants to pay for them from their own funds. Culpepper wrote back to England in November that he wanted instructions on how to handle 
native complaints against the English. In December, it is revealed that the Crown and the colony are still at odds on how to administer this tobacco tax. The Commissioners of Customs drafts a letter where they state that the Virginia law will not be executed. Instead, the matter will be referred back to the Governor of Virginia. They also stop accepting tobacco shipments. Essentially, this law is repealed by the Crown, and no tobacco can be supplied from Virginia to England in the interim. The Committee of Foreign Plantations prepares to draft another round of instructions to Lord Culpepper. On December 15th, Culpepper puts before the committee a unique solution to ease Virginia's economic pain. He recommends selling tobacco to the Tsar of Russia. There's only one problem. Tobacco is forbidden in Russia. In January, the king sends a letter to Sir Henry Chickalee, informing him that he will order Culpepper to repair the government. The Committee of Trade and Plantations also sends a letter to Chickalee informing him that he cannot call an assembly without seven yes votes from the council. On January 27, 1682, King Charles II sends another round of instructions to Lord Culpepper. And I will tell you, having read these instructions, 82 of them itemized out. They just go on and on and on. The first order was to, quote, repair Virginia. The second was to form a council with the names of the council provided. So here's going to be your council. And among them was Sir Henry Chickley, Nathaniel Bacon. There was a second Nathaniel Bacon, believe it or not. And I cannot find anything on what distinguishes those two. Yes, one was a rebel, but who was this other guy? Believe it or not, as I've tried to search, I find next to nothing on, you guessed it, a second Nathaniel Bacon. Philip Ludwell was also in this group. Some other interesting instructions. Well, number 12 requested submission to the crown of all laws passed under penalty of one year salary. The 14th instruction was all fines would be payable to the king. And the 17th instruction said that no fines would exceed 10 pounds. The 20th instruction was that there would be no displacement of judges or sheriffs without due cause. Another one was to not create or dissolve any office without special order from the crown. One instruction implemented the religious practices of the Church of England. The instructions go on and on about how to tax liquor, an allowance to tax tobacco, how to elect the assembly, the handling of estates, the arming of all planters. Uh, one requested the building of public workhouses for the poor and indigenous. At the end of these 82 instructions, the original instructions from December 1679 are voided. I would only hope so because Governor Culpepper had to be overwhelmed reading all of these instructions and it seems like the Crown has opted to take a very hands-on approach to the administration of the Virginia Colony. Will it work? How will it go for Lord Culpepper? We'll find out next time on Historical Context.